Bona tarda i i a tothom. Em donem fem iniciem ja el el la trobada. Bé, aquesta serà una una és una benvinguda als als participants, socis i sòcies a la setzena trobada en nom del Consell Directiu de la Societat Catalana d'Història de la Ciència. Bé, ateses les circumstàncies, fa uns mesos aquest consell i el comitè organitzador de la trobada van decidir seguir endavant, fer la trobada i adaptar-la al format telemàtic. Aquesta salutació significa que hem arribat a port, que el gran esforç esmerçat pels nostres companys de la Cant ha estat un èxit. La trobada que fem cada dos anys és també el moment cada dos anys, com sabeu, de fer una assemblea extraordinària, avaluar la situació i plantejar-nos el futur de la societat. En guany, atès a la disponibilitat de temps i la càrrega telemàtica, hem pensat ajornar-la un, un poc de temps. Us convocarem aviat al respecte. En tot cas, cal insistir en un fet fonamental, el gran dinamisme i capacitat de les persones que formen part de la societat catalana d'història de la ciència. Això ens ha permès mantenir i continuar el gran volum d'activitats, en alguns casos fins i tot ampliar-les. I només vull destacar els projectes de treball en curs, per una banda en temps de Covid-19 i per una altra banda saber en acció. Aquest Consell Directiu, com sabeu, dona suport a les iniciatives dels socis i aposta per invertir diners i esforços en persones joves, tot ajudant en la seva formació professional. Malgrat aquesta empenta, no hi ha dubte que el balanç social és negatiu almenys en termes presencials, quan sabem que són la base de les nostres relacions. Per sort, les arrels socials i emocionals eren i són tan fortes que ens permeten mantenir la inèrcia. En fi, amics i amigues, us enyorem i us voldrien abraçar. Ja ho farem. Fa uns mesos vam donar suport a la decisió dels nostres col·legues de la CAN de seguir endavant amb la trobada i modificar i adaptar l'organització al format digital. Us felicitem. Any menys especial s'han d'anar també al Comitè de Comunicació, que és un grup d'estudiants, d'antics de, de, estudiants del Màster d'Història de la Ciència i de Comunicació Científica, que farà un esforç molt gran per a donar a conèixer tot el que, totes les nostres discussions. I finalment, és clar, aquesta trobada no hauria sigut possible sense l'ajuda dels companys del Comitè Organitzador, tant d'Enrique Perdiguero i Eduardo Bueno a la Universitat Miguel Hernández com d'Antonio García Belmar en la Universitat de Bacar. Abans de terminar, volem explicar algunes qüestions organitzatives. En primer lloc, com sabeu, el programa és molt intens, per això vos demanem la vostra cooperació per a fer respectar el temps indicats al programa. Recordem també que, segons l'horari, caldrà deixar lliure la sala de presentacions quan termineu. Demanem que tant els participants com el públic entrin en la sala paral·lela i que tinguin ahí eh, obertes les dues pestanyes i navegar, o, o en dos navegadors diferents, les dues, les dues sales, en, en dues, en, amb, amb els dos enllaços corresponents. Per això, les persones que organitzen o moderen poden llegir les preguntes que han rebut a la sala de, de presentacions i traslladar-les a la sala de reunió. Els ponents podran continuar el debat i respondre preguntes i el públic, és clar, també està invitat a participar i intervindre directament en aquesta sala eh, paral·lela. Havíem mostrat, havíem pensat, quan estàvem organitzant la trobada, eh, passejar-vos per una gran varietat de llocs científics d'Alacant, com per exemple l'antic hospital provincial, que serà un museu, o bé l'antic institut històric provincial, que té unes col·leccions d'instruments molt interessants, també tenim altres espais, com per exemple el Col·legi de Farmacèutics amb, 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 amb patrimoni farmacèutic, com per exemple el de la farmàcia Soler, l'espai del port, on podem trobar la duana o l'edifici de sanitat exterior, també la Casa de Socors o la Casa de la Segurada, que és ara un, un, un museu, un museu d'art contemporani. Per altra banda, la ciutat també n'hi ha espais relacionats amb la història de l'alimentació, com el mercat central, o història industrial, com l'antiga fàbrica de tabacs, també amb les epidèmies, com per exemple el Panteó de Quijano, que es va fer per la, una epidèmia de còlera. També altres espais menys coneguts, com per exemple el mareògraf i la cota zero eh, topogràfica, o espais relacionats amb l'aigua, com els pous de Garrigós. També altres espais relacionats amb, amb, amb la guerra civil. I fora de la ciutat també podríem trobar una gran varietat d'espais de, de la ciència, com per exemple eh, el sanatori Fontilles, o bé les salines de la Mati de Torrevella, que és un espai industrial des del segle XIV, 
o el Palmeral Dels, un, un espai botànic de, de reconegut per l'UNESCO, i també altres ciutats, com per exemple Alcoi, edificis hospitalaris i fins i tot una, un gran patrimoni eh, industrial. En tot cas, us invitem a vindre eh, a visitar físicament i no només virtualment aquests llocs quan siga possible. And now it's time to welcome Professor Christopher Hamlin eh, from the University of Notre Dame, where he's professor of history and in the program in history and philosophy of science. Professor Hamlin is very well known to most of us for some reasons. He is one of the most relevant experts of the history of public health. Furthermore, 10 years ago, many of you had the opportunity to enjoy his talk at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Professor Hamlin is extremely interested in the connections between different, different disciplines and the role played by a large variety of experts in science and society. Some of his books, like A Science of Impurity and Public Health in the Social Justice in the Age of Chadwick, become an essential reference to all scholars interested in the history of water analysis, water infrastructures, public health and controversies between physicians, biologists, engineers, politics, and public authorities. Later, he expanded his interests to environmental issues, forensic, forensic sciences, and concepts of disease and demicity. Publishing books like More Than Hot, A Short History of Fever, and Cholera, the biography. Apart from being a prominent scholar, Professor Hamlin is a dedicated educator, really motivating for his students at Notre Dame and even two others visiting temporarily his faculty. It's our pleasure to invite Professor Hamlin to start his conference with the plenary lecture titled, Trust me, I'm, a, I'm an historian of science, reflection on our field as a response to crisis. Christopher, the floor or the cloud is yours. Thank you, uh, Ignacio. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. I, it's, a, it's a great honor to be asked to deliver this lecture. Um, and it's also uh, something I wish I could be there with you because I feel that um, conferences like this, um, a lot of the uh, value of the conference is to talk to people individually. And that also makes me think about the wonderful conversations I've had over the years with several of you. And the first face I saw when I opened up the Zoom was Alfonso Zoroso. And uh, it was a very long time ago that he and I began to talk about public health in, in, in cities. And then more recently, you mentioned uh, my visit to Barcelona in 2010, um, that um, Jose Ramon and Agusti uh, hosted. And uh, more recently, Ignacio has come to work with us. So um, I have a, a long series of, of wonderful contacts with, with many of you. And there are academic contacts as well as personal contacts because many of the ideas that we have talked about have, um, I've thought about and they've become important in my work over the years. Um, I chose as a topic um, something that is broader than much of the work that I do, but I thought it was timely because um, on the one hand, we are living in a time of crises and some of the crises are sort of biological crises, the crisis of the COVID pandemic, the crisis of uh, climate change, but also um, they are cultural crises. And particularly in my country, we are right now in a very deep cultural crisis and the history of science is part of that cultural crisis. So I'm going to tell you um, some stories and some of these stories are American stories about our field. Um, they are sometimes stories about a particular university. But I tell you those stories because I would like us to think about how different or similar things are in other parts of the world where the history of, of science has very different uh, sorts of origins. 
So um, this particular little quip, um, imagine this COVID a conspiracy? Surely not, the scientist says. I speak for the quark. Not only on pandemics, but on climates and other matters, speaking for the quark no longer works. More broadly, scientificity seems less obvious as a viable public approach. So what role do and should historians of science have when science itself is suspect and historians as mediators are sometimes seen as complicit in or even responsible for that distrust. Hence this question in my title, if you trust me as an historian of science, what are you trusting me to do? As studiers of academic disciplinarity, we should be embarrassed by how little we examine our own discipline. I begin with a familiar but enigmatic book, Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Students still puzzle, stasis or change, descriptive or normative, and what precisely is a paradigm? You may know that book, know that the book and Kuhn's move from physics to the history and philosophy of science came from his experience as assistant to James Conant, Harvard president and developer of a novel history of science-based approach to general science teaching. And even of Conant's critical Dear Tom response to Kuhn's draft. Now, when you get a letter that uh, talks about from your advisor that talks about being worried and uses the term frankness, you should actually worry. While the comments are those of a mentor, they reflect profound differences, both in understanding science and in presenting it to the public between the chemist Conant and the physicist Kuhn. The assumption of a common Cold War agenda taken by Kuhn's biographer, Steve Fuller, among others, has disguised those differences. So my first aim will be to clarify that difference and Conant's reasons for committing himself to the history of science as the best means to mediate crises in the relations of science to democracy. Conant is the most important articulator of a social role for our field and not just, I think, in America. If few traces remain of his teaching approaches, we still rely on his rationales for our field. I turn next to what I call a chemist's way, a history of science based in terms of phronesis, practical reasoning, rather than natural philosophy and metaphysics, what I call the physicist's way. I then turn away from American stories about the history of the history of science to the broader questions of the cultural role of our field, to the assumption that it will always have local rationales, exemplars, crises, and needs. I illustrate this by considering two Catalan scientists, Metu Orfila and Haumek Ferran Iclua, before closing with thoughts on the clients of the history of science and its foundations of trust. Part one, James Conant became Harvard's president in 1933. Having transformed that university, he moved on to co-managing America's wartime research effort, including oversight of the Manhattan Project, and then to start a history of science movement that would be the center of his work until 1952, though he was still advising the government on science and weapons policy. Then after a stint as ambassador to West Germany, he took on reform of American secondary education. We mainly know Conant for using history of science to teach science to non-scientists, yet it was part of his own disciplinary formation. In 1910, as second semester chemistry undergraduate, he took a course on the history of physical chemistry taught by the Nobelist and his future father-in-law, T.W. Richards. 
he would come to see science as intrinsically historical. It was accumulated rather than reflective knowledge, as was evident in the literature review of any research paper. What to Kuhn was the taming of the past through consolidation of a paradigm whose members can only be kept at work if they are prevented from fully appreciating different ways of doing things, past or future, was to cone it the basis of critical engagement. Scientific creativity came as consciousness of history. Imagination, not accumulated anomalies, drove change. Hence, like a general, one studied strategies as well as tactics in becoming a scientist. Very much in the spirit of later actor network theory, a scientist needed sharp historical senses to operate in a political and cultural landscape. Indeed, as university president, the chemist Conant saw history as the centerpiece of higher education, cultivating it both in and beyond the classroom. If science was essentially historical, what role was there for a professional historian of science? Maybe none. I doubt there is anywhere in the world a career counselor who suggests historian of science to young persons seeking a profession. If we exclude historians of medicine and of technology, and they would have excluded themselves, very few would have qualified as professional historians of science in America before 1950. Outside Harvard, there had been some efforts to make science a central part of the new Western civilization curriculum. And though events at Harvard did lead to a career path in the history of science, that was an unintended consequence. Here it helps to distinguish teacher, field, career, and profession. Conant as educator focused on teaching. Students would appreciate the process of science through exposure to case studies of experimental inquiry. He saw no intrinsic virtue in the history of science as a field, nor a career, much less a profession. While there might be demand for critical editions of important texts, there was no warrant for a graduate program because there was no market. Also resident at Harvard since 1916 was another chemist, George Sarton, who we know as founder of ISIS. To Sarton, the history of science was a field. He was its representative and he peppered President Conant to fund the research institute in which he would be chief. Conceiving science as a great human achievement, he held that one could only understand its parts in terms of its whole, all disciplines, times, places, and cultural contexts, and all languages. Sarton was embarrassed by his poor Arabic. Sarton did lecture and had assistants, but took little interest in training successors. But how to represent the history of science? Conant's experimental case studies approach was only one of five options in the post-war general education curriculum for students not concentrating in science to meet a science requirement. All were historical. One on the life sciences concerns social and ethical implications. Conant's and one other in mathematical physics were essentially lab-like in reconstructing reasoning historically. Two others were appreciation courses. One highlighted science-based technologies. The other, taught by Sarton's protege, I.B. Cohen, treated the history of science as intellectual history. Cohen, Conant's was the most radical innovation and the heart of the history of science movement that he successfully promoted to institutions across America. He had assured, he had assumed scientists would teach the new courses. Lawyers, after all, taught the history of law. And some did, but many felt unprepared and saw history as an unrewarding distraction from specialist teaching. Students and teachers found Conant's course hard, 
thinking is harder than memorizing. Kuhn felt inadequate teaching it. Leonard Nash, stellar chemistry teacher, though never stellar chemist, was probably responsible for what success it had. Yet within a decade, Harvard had decided that general education in science could be left to mass lectures by star researchers who taught whatever they wanted. Well, the history of science program, that history of science program died at Harvard. In the meantime, rising demand for history of science during an era of rapid university growth had led to graduate programs and professional, <clears throat> excuse me, had led to graduate programs and professional disciplinary training in many universities. Conant, having gone on to other missions, was quickly forgotten. Credit for founding a discipline that now seemed to warrant no, to need no further warrant, went to Sarton and Cohen. In 1955, at an invitation only meeting organized by the National Science Foundation and the American Philosophical Society on the relation of the history, philosophy, and sociology of science to science itself, philosophers enthusiastically and sociologists ambivalently saw their work as part of science. Cohen, speaking for historians, declared his field's independence. It was not part of science. It needed no external validation. We rarely reflect on the consequences of that change. A division of academic labor may sanction an independent history of science, but it also justified the omission of history from the practice of science. One can thus see the replacement of Conant's science in which historical consciousness was the foundation of creativity by Kuhn's in which paradigms blinded us from history as an outgrowth of that very division. Only in a few fields like psychoanalysis and theoretical physics would critical engagement with the past be part of the present. I have begged a question, however, just what did Conant think close visits with Boyle's air pump experiments would do for non-science bound students? Just what critical problem did the history of science solve? A common view, Fuller's, is that Conant's curriculum was designed to fail. It was not to democratize science, but to protect science from democracy. Revealing how confusing even relatively simple science could be would convince students to leave science to scientists. Here it is often assumed that Conant was furthering Vannevar Bush's endless frontiers agenda, government funding of pure science administered by elite scientists. They had produced the bomb that won the war, only if left free would they produce whatever the future might need. Yes and no. Conant supported modest funding of good science, but as university president and wartime science administrator, he knew that squabbling disciplinary scientists did not speak with the universal voice of rationality, and also that there was no way around the lay persons the public elected. Always they would be the paymasters. Moreover, Conant's politics were anti-elitist, an outsider to Harvard. He loathed the class-based intellectual elites, as well as totalitarian authoritarianism that relied on scientific warrants. Finally, he worried that big science, projects possible only with government funding, was not good for science. They converted thinkers into administrators and grant getters diluted the ranks with a proletariat stuck in stultifying paradigms. In this light, it is worth noting that Conant's own research creativity came through paradigm transgression. He had effectively done two doctorates in structural organic and in physical chemistry, and some of his important work was at their interface. The immense work of designing case studies 
making a trial run in 1947 of having outcomes evaluated by an educational psychologist is incompatible with the cynicism thesis. Conant certainly understood that expertise was inaccessible. What concerned him was not deference, but delegation. Leaders like Harvard graduate Franklin Roosevelt were not surrendering authority in deploying specialists, but always they would have to assess, to shut down a program or to allocate more funds. A good many scientists were not happy about that. Having tasted autonomy in the war years, they saw themselves as sole representatives of rationality. Part two, all persons are either physicists or chemists. For four decades, I have puzzled over this sagacious comment by my doctoral mentor, the chemist and historian of chemistry, Aaron Ide, like Kuhn, a Conant teaching assistant in 1952. My chemist's physicist distinction is the outcome of my search for enlightenment. And as you can well imagine, when your doctoral advisor tells you uh, you're either, you must either be a chemist or a physicist and you're an earth scientist, you then have a crisis of identity uh, and uh, aren't sure whether you're a person at all. I think I was contrasting approaches to authority. These may be variously represented. One evident in the conant kuhn exchange is between science as a sacred noun with clear features that demarcate insiders from outsiders or as an active verb. Sciencing was a term used in, Co in Conant's circle. Another is top down and bottom up between claims of transcendent authority or the local application of specialized expertise to particular problems of public clients. Both figure in my three departure points here. The first is Ide's own 1956 article on the pillars of modern chemistry. There he challenged two textbook views, one that there was no chemistry before Lavoisier's belated scientific revolution, the other that chemistry was alchemy stripped of its nonsense. Instead, Ide saw chemistry as artisanal knowledge in alchemy, medicine, and metallurgy. Notably, his analytic of authority is Conant's experiment. Notably too, this artisanal knowledge, what I will begin to call expertise, is local, usable, and requires trust. Notably too, before the mid 19th century, this chemistry had no place in the official knowledge of universities. The second departure is the philosopher Stephen Toulmans, and by the way, that's a picture of Ide over on, over on the left there, uh, is the philosopher Stephen Toulmans uh, early 1982 critique of view from nowhere philosophies of science. Pointing to the increasing centrality of environmental and human sciences and drawing on the etymological linkage of truth to trust, Toulmin argued that the traditional role of the scientist as privileged theorist must give way to an interactive role. Later, in historicizing his argument, Toulmin suggested that what science should be depended on the needs of the time. <clears throat> Both Descartes and Leibniz sought to settle the post-Reformation chaos <clears throat> with a new metaphysics as authoritative and comprehensive as scholasticism. Such intervention had been valuable if most it is most familiar as Newtonianism, but it would be most profound in Germany as the Weltweisheit or universal rationalization promulgated by Leibniz disciple Christian Wolff in bestsellers like Rational Thoughts on God, the World, and the Soul of Man, and on all things whatsoever from 1718. Wolff's followers would aspire to the role of professional authority in the only comprehensive domain, philosophy. 
or abstraction, not achievement, is the strongest base of professional authority, as the sociologists of professions Magali Larson has noted. And she is my third departure point. Now to the chemists in seven different roles. First, the chemist as pastor, Johann Arndt, Lutheran minister, whose four books on true Christianity from 1605 to 1612 was the most important German devotional of the 17th century and challenged the aloofness of Lutheran orthodoxy leading to the uh, movement called pietism for which it would be the seminal text. Yet part of Arndt's popularity came from the worldly fourth book, a Paracelsian cosmology of providential technologies reflecting his own work as physician alchemist. It would engender a spiritual engagement with the world known as physical theology that blossomed in North Germany from 1720 to 1760. Nor was Arndt unique in blending alchemy, medicine, and ministry. Second, the chemist as theologian is Robert Boyle, who in the name of the experimental philosophy of the new Royal Society, challenged the authority of the Cambridge Platonists, Henry Moore and Ralph Cudworth. Both sides worried about enthusiasm, sectarians claiming private lines to God, but against an intellective approach in which ancient philosophy was invoked to authorize, as with Leibniz, a world as good as it could be, Boyle, in a free inquiry into the vulgarly received notion of nature, invoked both Calvin's voluntarism, the world was as God wanted it and not otherwise, and experiment, we know the world through the laboratory. Nature was a term without clear meaning, used as a false claim to authority, Boyle thought. Boyle was Conant's first exemplar in 1945. The chemist as public servant is Lavoisier, but seen differently, not as a modern Hypatia, a martyr to rationality overwhelmed by mob rule, but as an exemplar of the role of experts in French public life following Colbert's 1666 establishment of the Académie des Sciences as an institution of rationalized policymaking. Lavoisier's oeuvres are packed with reports on urban problems, lighting, water, gunpowder, fires, food, noxious trades, and sanitation. Some are single authored, others are committee reports. Lavoisier is not unique. Chaptal, Foucault, Guiton de Mauveau and others maintained the revolution, not by beheadings, but so by solving technical problems and reforming institutions for industry, education, and public health. They were not downloading a philosophy, a philosophical authority, nor claiming authority as a scientific estate, so much as relying on problem solving experience. In Aristotelian terms, representing the situated judgment of phronesis and techne more than episteme. <clears throat> For the chemist as economist, I pick Ellen Swallow Richards and Alice Hamilton. Where the conservation of energy is often seen as a metaphysical commitment, the conservation of elemental matter has long been a matter of practice. The idea of material budgets of chemical cycles would become particularly important in the 19th century and is intriguingly gendered. In the domestic chemistry home economics associated with the MIT chemist Richards, but also to a mapping of toxins in the workplace associated with the physician chemist and Harvard professor of industrial hygiene, Hamilton. The chemist as historian is John Theodore Mertz, his four volume history of European thought in the 19th century is still in print. Its publication followed emigration from Germany to England and a move from chemistry to electrical technology 
to history and philosophy at a time when disciplines were becoming the authoritative units of science, Mertz took a ways of knowing approach, recognizing disciplines and science itself as a conjuries of tools and explanatory agendas. Underlying authority was choice of method, but also pragmatism, mixing an evolutionary or a mechanical explanandum with a statistical one, for example. And over there, you see a list of the chapter headings of uh, Mertz's, Mertz's uh, first two volumes. The chemist as philosopher, <clears throat> among Mertz's strategies, is an atomic way of knowing. But those who see subatomic particles both as the intrinsic goal of science and a conspicuous basis of its authority, as does my sage of quarks, must puzzle over a view common among many 19th century chemists, including some of Conant's heroes, the physical chemists Arrhenius, Ostwald, and Ventoff, that the reality of atoms was less important than the heuristic use of the concept for disclosing phenomenal laws of continuous variation of measurable variables. Finally, the chemist as physicist. Conant's colleague, Percy Bridgman, awarded the 1946 Nobel Prize for high pressure experimentation. He was the world's best squeezer. This enchantment with the abstraction and unintelligibility of physical theories led to his development of the philosophy of operationalism. One knew only what one did in the laboratory. This is not some proto-paradigm concept, however. There is no absolving of choice within a normative concept of normal science, no capture within a worldview. Bridgman would expand this approach in many directions toward nominalism, existentialism, and libertarianism. All were anti-authoritarian. Always we choose what to accept. Among Bridgman's targets was the pretentious new priesthood of the atomic physicists with their social responsibility of science movement exemplified in Oppenheimer's famous statement following the Alamogordo bomb test that the physicists had known sin. But they were not special, Bridgman insisted. They might be good artisans. They were not martyrs or sages, but choosers who, like anyone, must live with their consciences. If Bridgman sympathized with Conant's history-based science teaching, he had no commitment to it as a social good, for there was no society, nor was democracy anything more than a default state. All chose all the time, public life was simply a composite. To Conant, the chemist for whom history ruled, that was naive. Ideologies were real, so too were institutions. Totalitarianism of right and left endangered democracy, and progressive change was an educator's job. <coughs> Part three. I have told a story in which scientists are their own historians, appraising their own careers, and world makers engaging pragmatically with issues of their own times. Under the heading of the chemist's way, I have also sketched a dialectic between claiming transcendent authority and recognizing a broader public authority of non-scientists. I have told an American story in which a leading educator saw an important public role for the history of science, one that would inadvertently generate a profession of historians of science. As educators, they would mediate but in behalf of what? You will know how these issues of science-based authority register in Catalan history. That they do is plain. For more than a century, science has been an important part of Catalan cultural identity, as evident from Antony Rossell's research on the work of the Institute for Catalan Studies and cur currently by its gallery of Catalan scientists. While well, Scotland may seem a similar case, there the focus is limited to the Enlightenment, and one could not make the same kind of case for Quebec, Ireland, or Wales, for example. 
Both Matu Orfila and Halme Ferran, the figures I touch on here, also count as chemists. My discussion of Orfila, and in many respects, the trajectory of ideas I have been exploring in this talk, owe much to the exploration by Agustin Nieto Galan and Jose Ramon Bertomo Sanchez of the problem of narrating the life of someone like Orfila. Arriving in Paris in 1807, in the golden age of French medicine, Orfila had become by 1830, Dean of the Paris Medical School, Secretary of the Academy of Medicine, and founder of a new field, toxicology. Yet he and his field have been largely invisible in accounts of that time and place. Though <clears throat> Orfila's toxicology involves precisely the same methods and often the same issues as Majandi's physiology, the enterprises are separate. Notwithstanding its importance for environmental toxicology, his work has been invisible in the history of public health too. Orfila saw his career as a success, a measure of his own merit, and we should not dismiss that. Yet we should ask if he was shrewdly avoiding the most glorious frontiers, both in clinical medicine and in biomedical science, to become first in a field seen mainly in terms of caste, a domain doubtless necessary, but done by others. At the time, French science and medicine were notorious, not only for Francocentrism and Paris centrism, but for disciplinary hierarchies. Basic science took precedence over applied clinical medicine and surgery over ancillary medical sciences like chemistry. Hygiene publique was marginal, its legal aspects even more so. Anatomy at the morgue was far beneath that of the hospital. A medical deanship too may be less about leadership than administrative drudgery. That was the case at contemporary Edinburgh, for example. I don't have answers, only questions, but Orfila may well have gauged his options as those available to an outsider. Catalan status is more conspicuous with regard to the cholera vaccine trials of the Tortosa physician Jaume Ferran in 1884-85. In the midst of a pandemic, Ferran became, began a program of inoculations with live attenuated cultures on the precedence of Jenner and Pasteur. When his approach seemed to work, he was besieged by commissions of outside investigators. Many were critical, some hostile. It is worth noting that within Spain, support came from Barcelona, opposition from Madrid, which temporarily banned the inoculations. Ferran, working from home, had minimal resources either to control the uniformity of the product or to oversee a controlled trial. After the epidemic, Ferran went on to a successful career as microbiologist and public health administrator in Barcelona. Gradually, partly because making a good cholera vaccine remained difficult, he would gain respect, but often ambivalently. His was a lucky guess, but an audacious and irresponsible undertaking that should surely have been left to the Parisians. Both stories are tragic stories of metropoles and provinces. They can be extended to many cases where gender, racial, ethnic, or regional prejudices undercut not only careers, but science and problem solving. It is important to consider counterfactuals. For the history of public health, the separation of toxicology from physiology, for medicine more generally, as Bettina Warig points out, the abandonment of a unified pathology that would only be recovered in the 20th century. In Ferran's case, one can imagine a rational polity jumping in to support his work and to help administer the trials. Part four, Ferran returns us to trust and to the chemist's way. Many did trust him. He had met conditions of trustworthiness, trying the inoculations on himself and volunteer colleagues after experiments on animals. He was trusted without being able to claim science for his objectors owned official scientific authority and were able to impose ethics and methods on him 
that were not yet general and certainly not being adhered to by others who were intervening in the cholera crisis on more dubious grounds, sometimes coercively. So back to my original problem. If someone doesn't trust science, even actively distrusts it, so that they will take a position or action opposite to that with which that opposite to that which science would indi would indicate, a call, even backed with history, uh, to trust science, would will not likely be effective. While many of us are attracted to authority that is local and responsive, historians of science rarely think much about trustworthy relations with clients. Do we even have them? While we value critical work that will change views, we rarely think of readers who are not colleagues or who might not trust us in the way we would need to do if we were medical anthropologists, for example or for that matter, persons who worked in museums. And I note that as I look at the uh, schedule for later this afternoon, many of you do work in museums. And so many of you are probably much more aware of these issues than our academic historians of science like myself. Notably, while chemistry surely is science, those examples I have included under the chemist's way don't involve calling on someone to defer to science. Boyle, Bridgman, and the physical chemists in various ways challenge such calls. Most of the others highlight services. Orfila is our commanding authority about what not to eat. Moreover, the chemist's way was at least potentially integrative in comprehending all materiality. Richard's home economics is both the macrocosm of chemical engineering and of Barry Commoner's laws of ecology. Everything does have to go somewhere and there are more or less efficient ways of manipulating materials. Chemistry then conceived in terms of Ide's dichotomy is already the site of many of our encounters with trusted expertise. Both Conant and Bridgman titled works Science and Common Sense to both science did differ from common sense, but they were seeking as mediators to ground comfort and public trust in familiar and communal problem solving. But while I value the chemist's way as a means to avoid conversations that have become unproductive, I don't think it is sufficient or appropriate for historians of science uh, simply to be its champions. A reductive strategy would dehumanize science or at least reduce it to techniques without meanings. Here is not the place to explore what a constructive role the history of science might play in the modern world, but it is appropriate to think about that role in terms of clients, professionals, and trust. There are in philosophy, psychology, sociology, theology, education, and criticism more generally foundations for such a role. Shall we call it a cosmological therapist? But they have not so far been the foundations of our field, though I hope they will. And that's one of the things that I am working on uh, in the remainder of my career. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I look forward to a wonderful meeting as I'm sure you do. Um, and many thanks for the work that you do um, and for hopes that we can at some time be at the same place at the same time. Um, I hope to be in conversation with you uh, if you would like to follow up these issues. And so please uh, email me if you would like to do that. Um, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. It has been a, a pleasure. Uh, you, you said a, a lot of things, comparing different disciplines and also mixing the problems of the history of chemistry with the history of medicine and, and the problems of authority, trust. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> the public is invited to ask uh, questions. Uh, perhaps uh, they can use the, the chat if they
if they want, I can read the I can read the questions to Christopher. Um, so feel free for like five, ten minutes, uh, perhaps um, to send your send your questions. Mm, um, one. One interesting, also one interesting point. I can start with one, with one uh, point is coming back to to Conan's experience is about the role of teaching in in history of science. No, if the teaching and science pedagogy could be the the keystone or at least a good strategy to reconnect with. We, to reconnect the different history of science areas, but also to reconnect history of science with uh, science and with society. No, I think this was one of the points of your points. Is is right, Christopher? So this is um, one of those issues where I think we don't know very much about. Um, different educational systems. And um, even in America, universities um, differ a great deal in how they present history of science, um, who the students are in history of science classes, um, and what we think we're trying to do when we're teaching those students. Um, many of the students I teach are science students, but many of them are going to be, they want to be engineers or doctors. So they're not theoretical science students, um, but it's very hard to, um, it, or at least I should say this, over the course of my career, um, there's become much more diversity in terms of what people teach in history of science courses. And in many ways that's good, but it also means that we don't actually have uh, a good means to discuss with each other um, what we're trying to accomplish and why. And so part of my talk is to sort of ask us to think about that question. I am very much struck when I do archival work on the emergence of this, these curricula in the 1940s and 1950s, that the scientists who were um, thinking about this thought very deeply about it. They often, we now um, produce a paragraph or, or so for a grant proposal um, to fill in the box that says, uh, you know, what significant change will, will your work have? Uh, they were thinking about this much more carefully and they were debating it with each other. So you see sort of um, letters uh, between these, these people that go on for, for four or five or, or seven or eight pages of single spaced discussion of why do we presenting science in this way and what will be the, the, the outcomes of this and lots of different views on this. So I think that's what I would, I would hope that we could recover uh, more of. And we also have a, a question by Josep Simon. Uh, he say, thank you very much, Christopher. And also he say, what about grassroots history of science? Do, does it exist? How? And how? Yeah. So the question of grassroots history of science, in other words, history of science from the bottom up. And um, this is, I think, one of the places where the history of science would interface with anthropology. And so, you know, if, as we read works in our field, sometimes we find that historians of science will be bringing in works from. Um, anthropologists or sometimes social historians as well, who are talking about um, the views of the world and how to operate within the world sort of of uh, people who are not elites um, in, some, in, in some way or another. I think that um, that's really interesting. Um, it's also, and very important, but I think it's also um, 
very scattered, this work. There's not a, a clear set of theorists that we look to or sources that we look to to sort of say, how do you do this? Um, there have been at, at various times, back in the golden age of social history, I think there were. Um, so one of the things that I'm trying to do is to sort of th thinking about the term trust, trust is the gift that you know, we give to each other when we decide to uh, accept one another's um, authority in certain matters. Um, it's striking how little we use that term in uh, our field. And when we do, we haven't really examined, I think, what we mean by it. So one of the things that I've been doing in the past three or four years is trying to read um, theorists who have written about, mainly sociologists, some philosophers who've written about what trust is and how you measure it. And, and it's quite different from the sort of usual um, literature that we read about uh, how we acquire scientific knowledge. So I think um, there's a lot of interest again in America because uh, there's interest in this because we have this sense that there's a crisis that people don't believe in science anymore. And we need to figure out why not and what do they believe and how to restore this kind of trust. So I think that would be the important way to go forward in, in thinking more about a grassroots approach to uh, um, the history of science. Very good questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. Um, I don't know if, we, if there are more, more uh, questions because we all know that has been an, an intense talk um, and also, yes, I, I can read another one by Jose Ramon Bertomeu that he also expressed his gratitude and also says, uh, he said that you, you were talking about very interesting issue, uh, issues. Uh, four years ago, we have a talk by Naomi Oreskes in, in our society. Her talk was published one year ago in the book, Why Trust Science? I wonder whether you can make connections between your discussion on trusting history of science and her ideas on trusting science, taking into account the uncertainties, diversities of views and the social processes, also biases, regarding how science works in society, including the role of merchants of doubts, revolving doors or captured experts. Mm -hmm. So um, I had thought about uh including Naomi's work in this talk. But it would have, I think, dominated the talk and made it much more about uh, you know, my, my engagement with, with her ideas, and which is a, a complicated issue in, a, in its own right. So I, I decided not to bring that in uh, here. Um, and her book is relatively new and I wanna spend more, more time myself um, engaging with it. But I, I do want to go to actually connect this issue to the previous question. Um, so one of the one of the issues is um, when we look at this problem of the sort of distrust in science, where do we where do we locate it? And um, there's lots of places to locate it. And and to sort of locate it in one place is not to sort of say that it, that it doesn't also exist in other places. So thinking about uh, Naomi's earlier work, um, you know, one of the places that we need to locate it is, you know, a political economy of the use of media to um, uh, basically poison people's minds, I think, to distort their, their senses of, of uh, you know, what's going on for particular partisan purposes. And um, that's certainly happening. And um, the question that I sort of start with is the other end of that question. In other words, those techniques only work because there's a receptive audience. And so there's a culture, what's the cultural foundation of that receptive audience? And, um, the re and where, do, where does that take me? In America, it takes me to some very strange places which don't have very much to do with the history of science. It takes me 
back into the history of American Protestantism, actually. And when I start talking about Johann Arndt, I'm talking about, uh, you know, Lutherans in the early 17th century, and I'm talking about people like John Calvin, and I'm beginning to try to understand their notions of theodicy, for example, what do people think about how the world should behave toward them, um, thinking about the, the, the profound power of, of certain religious ideas that have persisted across the centuries and appear um, in times of crisis. So um, I think both of these are, appro are approaches to this common concept of trust and they, they, you know, they're complementary rather than, than divergent, but they, are, but they are certainly different. Yes, Eddie. Okay. Okay. So um, I think we are more or less on on time. So then we we thank you again very much, Christopher, for for your talk and also for for the questions. Now we will we will continue thinking. Uh, uh, in the following days, no, we will try to connect some of, re of your reflections with or with or with the different uh, mm, communications or, or talks we we have. And also, I remember one. I remind. I, I will remark one of your of your last sentences in the in the in the in the last slide about the host for meeting you again in the in the same place. I I I, I wish. This, this could happen very, very soon. So thank you, thank you very much, Christopher. And, um, and it has been a pleasure. Yes, perhaps, perhaps there is still time. Do you agree, Christopher, for one more question? Yes? Christopher? Yes. Okay, I still I, we have re received one more question. If you, if you agree, I can I can throw. Uh, as we sure that we want to stand for the recovery of trust in science, or should we try to display the debate to which sciences should we trust? Which ways of producing knowledge or things are socially better than others? Can we, as historians, make the debate more complex? It's a question by um, Jaume, Jaume Sastre or Jaume Valentinos. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So, it's, again, it's a, it's a very central question. It's a very important question about um, again the question of trust, what, what are we trusting and sort of what's, what's the historian's role in trying to sort of mediate the, that trust. And my reason for talking a lot about expertise is because um, we can't live without expertise. Um, and all the time, you know, in everyone's life, there are situations where, you know, we sort of say, we're so thankful that we ran into a person who has the expertise, in many cases, these are medical issues, who has the expertise to solve a really serious medical, medical problem. So, you know, we can't um, get rid of relying on expertise. A lot has then to do with the, the term science. And, you know, one of, when I sort of set up this notion of a kind of um, a, a person, a sage who speaks on the name of science, what I was hoping to do was to sort of say, well, um, you know, science is the basis of the expertise and I am, uh, you know, a supporter. I think science is exceptionally important, but I'm not sure that the word, um, the word has become problematic. And so that um, when I sort of talk to people about what I think is rational, I'm not likely to say, well, I believe in science. I'm likely to want to say, well, I, I find this particular kind of expertise and often it's, 
things in public health um, where statistical methods are being used. And I sort of said, let's look at the statistics this way and that way. And I'm sort of suggesting that, you know, the reason that I come to certain conclusions has to do with the way that I read these statistics and, uh, or the way that, um, uh, you know, when I get into situations of analytical chemistry, um, I have some basis in analytical chemistry and, um, you know, I, I know, know how to, I know why I'm confident about some sorts of things. So, but again, I don't see that I get anything added by simply calling that science. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Then now it's, it's time to, to, to move to the other sections, to continue, in fact, to start the, with, the, with, the, with the sessions. So we really appreciate it again. And thank you very much, Christopher. Bye-bye, y'all. Bye-bye.